everyone. Welcome to The Gray Zone. I'm Anya Parampil here with a very special guest, filmmaker, director, screenwriter, Oliver Stone. His latest documentary is Nuclear Now. It is out in the United States this week. Welcome back to The Gray Zone, Oliver. Thank you, Anna. I'm a longtime fan of your films, whether I'm talking about your screenplays that are obviously some of the best to have come ever come out of U.S. film, but also your documentaries, your South of the Border film definitely made a huge impact on my own pursuit of Latin America coverage and trying to understand our, our immediate neighborhood. And so I was really excited to get the chance to review Nuclear Now. And what I loved about it is that a lot of times with documentaries, and of course, I fall into this myself, people are documenting a problem or demonstrating a problem, looking at it from all sides. But what you're doing here is actually talking about a solution to a problem and something that has been misunderstood for decades, and that's nuclear energy as a source of power. I'm wondering, how did you decide to take on this subject? <laughs> okay, uh, that's a good question because it's not my up my alley normally. I'm into feature films about generally subjects that concern me, but I could not make a feature out of nuclear energy because it's very difficult. I mean, probably someone out there in your audience can figure out a way to do it. I'm not, I, I think it can be done as a feature, but inside the context of the time I was in and the, I felt like the documentary was the best way to go because it would cut right to the chase. You can't do that in a feature film. You, you Otherwise, you're it's a pamphlet and you get accused of, you know, exposition and all that. So, you know, you could do this. At one point, my my co-writer, Josh Goldstein, who uh, wrote the book Bright Future, on which this is based, uh, uh, wrote a, a treatment for me uh, with a female scientist like yourself going to the end of a very close to death and threats everywhere to to make nuclear energy to to save nuclear energy and like save the whales or something and it was a it was a wonderful fairy tale ending but i didn't believe a word of it uh so it, i don't think it's up to any one person to solve this thing i think it's not a movie script it's more of a it's a nation issue and it's a worldwide consciousness issue and as i said at the end of the movie I do think this moment in time, this period in time, we are more conscious than ever of the environment, than ever. And I think more people realize that we're in trouble and that we have to do something about it. So I think people are more open uh, to this uh, obvious solution, which has always been obvious, but which has been obscured by the forces of, call them time and evil. <laughs> Time and evil. Uh, and I think there's a lot of deliberate obfuscation and stupidity here at work. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. The film was, not, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go on on because you know me, I can go on for five minutes. Go ahead. Oh, I don't mind at all. The more information, the better, of course. Oh. But <laughs> you're talking about the deliberate obfuscation of the truth when it comes to nuclear. And of course, part of that is also it's developed a lot rapidly. We're capable of something greater than we were decades ago when this first yeah. became part of the discussion on energy. And one of the things that you point out about how people have adopted a, a an inaccurate or incomplete picture of nuclear nuclear is how the fight against a nuclear war or nuclear catastrophe in that sense kind of became part of the conversation around nuclear energy. And so you're trying to separate that. What can what can you say uh, about that topic? Well, it's just so scientifically obvious that they're so different. Nuclear energy is not a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb is constructed. It's much more complicated. It takes time and rich plutonium, et cetera. This, uh, as you, the IAEA it monitors that very closely. You're not going to build a bomb in your backyard. That's crazy. And even a dirty bomb, it's so, it, you get into these silly scenarios that, it, to block progress. In other words, there's all these reasons. What if, what if, what if I'm sick of it? I've been hearing what if for almost a year, two years of this project, uh, the what ifs, you know, we can't live our life. What if, uh, in, in, as we say in the film at one point, there should have been more accidents. There was only one significant 
life-threatening accident that was at Chernobyl in 1986. The Fukushima was a, was a myth because no one died. No one died of radiation poisoning in all of Japan. It was the tsunami that killed 18,000, 20,000 people. And that was not known. I mean, people have this misimpression of Chernobyl and, and Fukushima killing millions of people. It's bullshit. Same thing is true about the American experience at Three Mile Island that was so hyped by that movie Jane did, Jane Fonda. It was a wonderful movie. I enjoyed it, China Syndrome. And for I was a mild believer in in, in uh, anti-nuclear position. I, went, I didn't take a stake in it, but you know it just seemed the right thing to do. We had no nukes concerts in the 80s. We had Bruce Springsteen. We had uh, uh, Jackson Brown. Uh, everyone you know who was glamorous, who was a movie, music or movie business, was against nuclear and the movie business has done no favors to nuclear believe me uh including uh china syndrome including silkwood which was a wonderful film with meryl streep and then years later of course on television we had <laughs> chernobyl the series from uh, hbo which has done no which was so negative and so untruthful and we got, went to russia we talked to the uh, scientists uh, who were deeply stricken by their accident and it was clear that there was guilt uh, on their part, but there was no collusion to lie to the IAEA or to the public about it. And he, so in other words, Chernobyl was completely hyped up and made worse than it was, as if it was another Ralph Nader nuclear disaster, which it wasn't. Chernobyl did happen, and it's good that it happened because it was a it was a lesson in you need a containment structure. And so, as you said, there have been technological improvements, but there was nothing wrong with the original. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of, I hate to bring it in, but the JFK debate, everybody in the world, I swear, you know, doesn't, doesn't even watch the movie I made or watch the documentaries I made, but they all have an opinion. Everyone has their opinion about Kennedy. Oh, he did this. He was shot here. He was done that. Or, and it goes on and on and on. But Anything that doesn't come back to the CIA or U.S. government, any other explanation is fine. Oh, sure. Gangsters, this uh, mob. I mean, every explanation in the world. But it's the same problem. It's just be rational, go to science. And when you go to either case, you're going to find out that it's just impossible the way they, they described it as happening. And uh, that's the problem. We we live in with a lie. We Too many mythologies set in. Uh, I, I, and, and it so, takes... It takes a lot of bravery to start picking apart those myths and those lies that we don't even recognize as as myths or lies. We just recognize as fact. Right. And I think nuclear is one of those issues. Was there something that surprised you the most as you ventured to make the film? Nothing surprises me anymore than as to the stupidity. As, as Einstein said, the, the stupidity of the human being is is just unbelievable <laughs> but we, we're there's a lot of myths in the world you know first of all we go into the radioactivity question we go into background radiation versus dangerous radiation scary versus dangerous we talk about radiation very forthrightly it's always been known people may not know it but dna plays a role here because dna does repair our bodies all the time so we're subject to radiation on a daily basis we eat a banana we're subject to radiation we live at an altitude we fly on a plane radiation is with us it's part of the human process it's heats it warms the earth it's a beautiful beautiful element in the in the uh, god given natural planet we have radiation is is part of the deal has cosmic rays bouncing off us all the time. And okay, so we go into that one and then we go into the issue of uh, nuclear waste, which seems to be the greatest bugaboo of all. What if, what if? Radio radioactive waste is not to be feared. It's something that has monitored, dealt with, closely monitored. The, the in, nuclear industry is the, monitors is the closest because, but it's at the same time, it's the smallest amount of waste. Nothing compared, compared to oil, gas, coal, nothing compared to those industries that muck up the universe, toxic chemicals, all, all the chemical industry, the gas accident, the Bhopal in India, far, far more dangerous than, than uh, nuclear has been. Nuclear is well handled and it's been well studied. And, and we're talking about geniuses here. The nuclear industry has to be developed and more and more, the, we know more and more about it, we handle it better, but it was never a problem. 
even in 1970s when France built 15 reactors in a record, uh, no, 57 reactors in a record 15 years, France didn't have a problem. They, they, it works and 70% of France is electric. We need electricity. It's a crucial element in the coming world. Electricity is gonna be a vast demand and not only electricity, but we have to heat transportation. We have to heat buildings and factories and there's industries like cement, steel, fertilizer. All this is gonna require a tremendous energy and that's, it has to be a global picture. It's not about the United States, it's about the globe. How are we gonna deal with this mass demand for energy? Uh, yeah, I've noticed actually just in the last few years, a lot of people who are concerned with the question of energy starting to ask these questions again about nuclear and that the main issue or question they always came up against was that of nuclear waste, the scare of Yucca Mountain and all that. And so I was fascinated to see how you address that point in your film. And also, as you said, shifting the way we think about energy deaths and catastrophe, because if you look at coal and oil, the deaths spurred by that, th those industries alone far out outnumber that those ca uh, those caused by the nuclear industry. So it, it is important, I think, that we we start to ask, wait, why why has the conversation about nuclear, why does it have these strict blinders on? Why has it been warped in this way? It would seem that there are powerful interests that don't want it, no? Well, there's certainly, we proved, we went to that a bit. Obviously, the oil, the gas and oil industry was, was uh, I put it this way, tried to, I can't, we cannot prove it because we, money moves in certain directions, but we know a certain amount of money was given to Friends of the Earth, for example, which was the first environmental group. And that was given by uh, Robert Anderson of Sinclair Oil, I believe it was. And that was, a, you know, that was $200,000. But that in 1970, that adds up to a lot of money and that start a group with it. So a lot of the environmentalists may not know it, but they are anonymously supported by these interests and maybe coal. But uh, because this is all privately done, you know, it's hard to, to uh, pinpoint. It. But the important thing to remember, and you mentioned gas and coal, but you have to say... Uh, People, that, this is very important to remember is that there's also methane gas and methane gas is what they're using to back up the renewables right now, up until, and that is a very poisonous short-term gas in the atmosphere, very dangerous methane. We don't talk about enough about it. We talk about gas and oil, but we don't talk about methane. When the, when the, the solar and uh, wind does not work, which is most of the time because it's night and it's winter and because uh, there's no wind or there's no, uh, the temperature's wrong. That's when they go, they use gas as the backup mechanism. And gas is a, is a very easy solution to say. And the newspapers don't take into account the methane. So everyone goes to gas because why? The companies advertise perfect partner for renewables. Mm. And, and on, not, no, go ahead. We're not against renewables. I mean, if they, but it's the backup mechanism for uh, renewables. It's dangerous. Nuclear is a perfect backup too. We need that electricity. We need that energy from nuclear in order to create this kind of volume. And there would be no nuclear has no uh, back. Uh, no, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, I can't use the word. I'm I, uh, I'm not technical about it, but there's no waste that's insignificant and there's no there's no danger from it like there is from gas is absolutely clean and that's what people don't but, you, you mean know. there's not something new produced some new element that's produced oh, yeah, I, was, I meant to say there's no backup required for nuclear it works it's 90 percent the maintenance levels are 90 to 100 percent i mean these things work forever they work 50 60 70 years some of these legacy reactors which we built by the way back in the 1970s and they still work some of them in other words this thing is a, it's a expensive to build in the united states anyway and but it lasts a long time and the maintenance is relatively simple compared to the other industries and if uh, we want to continue down the path of thinking critically about all of these alternatives we have People want to characterize 
a solar or wind energy as clean, but the process it takes to produce a solar panel and then yeah. transport a wind turbine, not to mention the war on the African continent that is required to gain all the minerals required to pro to, to, to build a solar panel That's should all be factored yeah. into what we consider clean or safe. But we and compare, as you know, in the film, we compare Germany because they went that way. They went with gas. They went with oil. Uh, I'm sorry. They went with coal, but they also went with wind and they went with renewables. They got rid of nuclear completely, which was a huge mistake. And they're in the, as you know, Germany's economy is now in the shitter because uh, they just, they're stupid. They were really stupid and they're supposed to be bringing people, but the, they should learn from the French in this regard, which they've always had this thing with the French. Not, uh, not to mention that tensions over oil pipelines, gas pipelines, and oil and gas reserves fuel war, including the one we're currently experiencing or witnessing play out in Ukraine. A lot of it has to do with these resources that are required for energy. That's How great. has your film been received by your colleagues, Oliver, and, and what was it like trying to get it distributed in the United States? Well, it wasn't easy. I mean, it, first of all, it was a very difficult film to make because it deals with abstract issues and sometimes they're not visible. But we tried to make everything visual in this documentary so that a ninth grader, an eighth grader could understand it. Because frankly, I was not an expert. I went through this with uh, Josh Goldstein and his partner, Stefan Svist, a Swedish nuclear engineer to try to understand. I traveled to France. I traveled to Russia, to Rosatom. I traveled to the in Idaho National Laboratory here in the United States to learn as much as I could from the people who know this. You need to talk to the people who know what they're doing. And uh, that's why uh, I, everything in this documentary has been checked out. They'll tell you that it's all bullshit or this and that, that it's not. It's an intellectually honest film. And deals with everything that's said in the film. I had to triple check, quadruple check, drove me crazy, took a long time. And it's not the normal way of working. Uh, you know, this is a documentary that does not allow for any opinion. It is a documentary that requires fact. And this is a strictly fact oriented documentary. And I'm very proud of it. I think it's one of the most important contributions I could make in my later years. Uh, I could make another feature film and I hope to one, at least one my 21st feature, but I've done, what, 10 documentaries, but this is the most, by far, the most important one. Joe Rogan, who I was on the other day, who, smart man, he's, he said, this is one of the most important films I've ever watched, which I'm very proud to. Uh, I to think learn. that's fair. The question of energy and our, and our future, everything, war, peace depends on how we are going to meet the demand of a growing planet. And exactly. when you have people pretty much saying that human are a cancer on the earth because it can't provide for it, well, that is a pretty slippery slope and a dangerous assertion to make. So we should instead be trying to think, how can we actually provide for everyone? The earth may actually so. give us the power to do so. You know, one of the key uh, people that we interview in the film is uh, the head of Rosatom, which is the Russian agency that deals with nuclear energy. Some 250,000 people work for Rosatom. It's, they take it very seriously. Now, this fellow, Mr. Likachev, who's a very bright man uh, and a great administrator, he's done a terrific job. He said very clearly in the film, he says, there are now 490 gigabytes of nuclear energy in the world. Gigabytes are billions, bi billions. That's a lot. 490, which is about... 400 reactors, maybe a little more. And he's saying, if we replace those uh, those gigabytes with energy of another kind, we would have two and a half billion tons of carbon, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, two and a half billion tons. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's he called it an extra lung. Nuclear energy is an extra lung for the earth. He's, he's concerned about the earth and he sees where this is going because in the 20 years we've been in love uh, with fixes and talking about solutions and in love with renewables like Germany spent, I mean, we spent trillions of dollars on renewables, Germany at least billions and maybe a trillion. And we've gotten nowhere the CO2 uh, levels have gone up slightly. 
That's what's frustrating. We're not realistic about this. We have to cut CO2 now in the next going on to the 2050 period, which the IPCC warned us about would be the uh, uh, the break point. Well, of course, there's always break points, but the truth is, there's only we have to think we have to think positively about the future, and we want a future we can look forward to. We don't want a future where we're competing for energy with some other country or amongst ourselves, and we're fighting as we are now, unfortunately, stupidly, and I think in Eastern Europe, and the United States has to think globally as a responsible leader about. And this is, I, you know, I've been harping on this point for years about having a real good relationship with China and a good relationship with Russia, which is possible. Yes. And I am convinced it's possible. You know damn well from your own experiences in South America that this is possible, but we keep denying it. We keep saying we have enemies. I, I want to believe that we're on the, the verge of a paradigm shift simply because we won't have a choice for much longer to live in this delusion where we can cut off ourselves from the rest of the world and keep pretending as though we're European kings, pretty much. You you said we have to speak positively and globally about the future. And I, I think we all it also has to be humane, humanely about the future. Humans are not the problem. Humans actually have all the unlimited potential in the world to to solve these these issues and and usher in a society in a world that's even better than what we're currently living under. And a lot of the people in charge seem to be telling us that the future is only going to get worse. So maybe that means That's we need to replace yeah. them. <laughs> Hollywood, you... Hollywood does. All, look at all the movies Hollywood puts out. They're all dystopian. They're all Exactly. Movies. It's disgusting. Why can't we have a little, I mean, I know Disney and all that, but we want to be positive. And we want our children, next generation, to hear positive messages. And I, Or at I, least... At least if it's not positive, because I'll say not all of your films are positive, but they they prompt critical thinking, societal yeah. introspection about how we can make something positive. Everything today is either apocalypse or superheroes that never arrive. That's all. That's all they make. I was very conscious of that when I was making this because the subject is a dark one. And I all I've seen is dark stuff about climate change and this and that and this. So I made a conscious effort in this to transition this from the dystopian side to the optimistic side. And we towards the end of the film, one of the scientists that we quote is uh, Stephen Hawking, who died uh, not too long ago. And he talks about the a future where we can meet it with optimism. And I think he is a beautiful, beautiful man. And he was a smart man. He believed in ener nuclear, nuclear energy. But most scientists who really know their stuff. But I believe. heard Elon Musk recently saying the same, something very similar. Good. Well, Endorsing the, the saying uh, that he, he seemed to be aware of a lot of the information that you put forward in your film. A few years ago, by the way, Musk was talking about batteries as a solution, not uh, nuclear energy. Now he's obviously... Clearly, it, batteries are great. We want to have bigger, better and better batteries, but there are limitations on batteries. Got to get lithium from somewhere, right? There's beyond that. There's how are you going to, it's a, this is a continent sized problem. This is a continent sized problem. This is not about fixing your home, your, your car, uh, or your, your phone. This is a really, or, this is so yeah. because India is coming on, Africa is coming on, Asia is coming on, Indonesia. Holy cow, we have so many people who are going to want more energy. They, they're not going to live on their, uh, like some poor peasant in India. They're just going to change. They, they're going to see, they see it on television. They hear it. They know what's going on. Mm -hmm. People want more energy. We have to accept that. We can't and people live here aren't going to go back and live under some controlled society where they're regulated and monitored in every way they, yeah, by the I, government. But that is the problem. You see, what we did with unknowingly, uh, we're all guilty of it. We used carbon. We we emitted, we used the carbon quota of the universe, so to speak. There was a carbon quota. We used it up. And now we're in this hole where other people will suddenly say, well, hey, I want to get some of that carbon. But they're, they're not going to be able to unless they pollute the universe. And they will, because it's the cheapest thing in the world is gas. I mean, is coal the cheapest thing in the world, plus wood. If they'll use wood, if necessary, they'll burn down all the trees. So uh, we have to solve the problem. Scientists have an obligation, a responsibility to be 
to to help solve this problem. And the United States could take the lead, but it hasn't. China and Russia have taken the lead. And that's, that's not ideological bullshit. This is just the truth. And they're doing the work that, on a mass scale that can solve these problems. For example, China, according to what I read, is building is building more and more nuclear reactors. So they also use a lot of coal, but they are putting up $440 billion worth of reactors. Another 170 by 2038 is the goal. That is a huge, huge amount and can help. I is exporting. Also, Russia exports to other countries and they should keep exporting, keep building because they have they can meet their own needs. But their export uh, exporting of uh, both SMRs, small modular reactors and bigger reactors are crucial. I, I, I was going to ask, since in the film you did go to Russia, you go to China, you meet with the people on the cutting edge of this technology and development. What do you think is holding the United States back? Fear. Fear and change. They're not, we're not good at change, I think. We just, we, we, we have a president who's a dinosaur. I mean, he's talking about Cold War bullshit still, you know, like China's our enemy. <laughs> how can it be our enemy if that's the end of the world there? How, uh, Russia's our enemy. Well, he needs enemies. I, I don't know. That's the, this, that's this Dr. Strangelove thinking of a World War II period. These people are dinosaurs. They got to be replaced. New generation people that think about the future in a completely different way. Yeah, who see it as something to hope for and not something to fret. You get, along, you get along with your people. You don't look for reasons to to have uh, you know, to have this dissent amongst each other. And this has been going on in the United States for a long time, too long. We keep demonizing, demonizing Russia. We keep demonizing China now. This is crazy time. There's no room for this dissension, this fighting. Let's get serious. Let's grow up, be adults, responsible. Let's fix this world. <laughs> it's uh, depressing to be, no, but I want to be positive and say that it can be turned around because we're smart and there's it's, a new generation coming. It's always darkest before the dawn. It's a cliche, sure. but that's, I, I like to think that since at this point, our leaders are either marching us into total apocalypse that, or, or, or yeah. that we're going to take over and actually change the way things are done, that the, that, the history of man tells us we're going to uh, defeat them and actually build something positive for all of us. And so that is what is so fascinating and important about the nuclear now question that you bring up. Because again, it's not even just about energy because energy is related to war and everything else that that it's from life. the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed is part of our daily life. So how can people see nuclear now, Oliver? Oh, it's available now, today, as of today. We've been screening it in uh, scientific uh, isolation, uh, scientific outlets like you know MIT, Harvard. We screened it in London. We screened it in Madrid and Paris, and you know we're getting it out there among the people who know the specialists. But now, today, June six, it's available on Amazon wide, and it's available on Google Play. It's available on iTunes. It's available. So you can look at it today if you want. And I urge you to do so or look at it in two parts. But look at it and maybe look at it twice. It's well worth it. It's not, this is not for profit. We couldn't get on Netflix. They wouldn't want us then. Too, too controversial, I guess, or maybe they just didn't like it. But it really is worth, it's important to see. And I, for that matter, I would go anywhere to any country just to show it. I want this to get around the world. I don't want it to be limited to uh, a few rich countries because that's not going to solve the problem. Um, well, thank you so much for making this film and for sticking with your commitment to thank you. shattering paradigms, reevaluating the way we think about history and the present future as well, ultimately. And I look forward to your next screenplay, your next feature film. Bless you, Anya. You're really, I wish all everybody in the future were like more like you and thoughtful and educated themselves and trying to find out the answer behind the headlines. Thank you. We'll talk soon, Oliver. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.